What up, everyone? Welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. This episode is brought to you by ShipStation. Listen, as folks adapt to this changing world, we're going to be buying more and more stuff online than ever before. And if you're selling online, are you ready to meet the demands of our new delivery-based culture? Be ready with ShipStation. ShipStation is shipping software, and it will help Save so much of your time. Let me tell you why. ShipStation helps online sellers of any size get orders out quickly, save money on shipping costs, and keep customers happy. No matter where you're selling, Amazon, Etsy, or your own website, ShipStation brings all of your orders into one simple interface, making them really easy to manage from any device, even from your cell phone. ShipStation works with all the major carriers, including USPS, FedEx, UPS, and even Amazon Fulfillment, so you can compare and choose between the best shipping solution for you and your customer, all within ShipStation. They even offer big discounts on shipping costs. Now, any business can access the same postage discounts that are typically reserved for large Fortune 500 companies. You'll always know you're getting the best deal. It's no wonder that Ship ShipStation is the number one choice of online sellers. You'll ship more in less time with the best rates available. It's even, although we ship our t-shirts through Blipshift directly, it's what I use on my home computer to just do basic business shipping from here at the Smoking Tire. Even if you just have a regular home office and you're not selling professionally, ShipStation can save you time and money. Right now, Smoking Tire listeners can try ShipStation free for 60 days when you use offer code TIRE. Make sure your business is ready to meet the demands of delivery culture. Get started at ShipStation.com today. Just click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and then type in TIRE. That's ShipStation.com. Enter offer code TIRE. ShipStation.com. Make ship happen. We're also brought to you by Crown and Caliber. Guys, they are back. Crown and Caliber has a really fun contest going on right now. They are giving away a $4,500 gift certificate to Crown and Caliber. That'll get you a Rolex, an Omega, Panerai, Breitling. It'll get you something from almost every brand they sell at Crown and Caliber. The drawing ends September 4th, and the winner will be announced September 12th. So go to crownandcaliber.com slash matt, crownandcaliber.com slash M-A-T-T to enter, crownandcaliber.com slash matt to enter for, to win a $4,500 gift certificate. Get the watch of your dreams at Crown and Caliber. Dot com slash Matt. And of course, we're brought to you by Auto Tempest, guys. Your time is valuable. Whether you earn a ton of money at your job or just a little bit of money, you've only got so much time. It's the only thing you can't make more of. So save it with Auto Tempest. Whether you're looking for a new daily driver, a collector car, an exotic sports car, or the basis of a new build, Auto Tempest will search the entire internet on your behalf. You don't need to go to every single individual car site anymore just autotempest.com and they have you covered whether you're searching locally long distance they they'll search craigslist they'll search ebay motors they'll search cars.com they'll search auto trader they'll search facebook marketplace you name it you just type it in auto tempest once they'll search all of it bring it back together into one place we love them and we love their support and we have a new announcement coming soon with auto tempest that will be very very fun all right on this episode really interested to talk to this guy i have uh, just finished his book it is called why we drive and it is a very interesting analysis uh of the uh the inevitability of the transition to autonomous cars why that might not be such a good idea, why we shouldn't treat it as an inevitability, and how technology has already shaped our culture and our driving and uh, the ups and downs of it changing from here. The author is a very interesting dude who also has won awards for his last book, Shop Class as Soulcraft, Matthew B. Crawford on the Smoking Tire Podcast. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me, man. Your, uh, your book is awesome. Why we drive. 
I Thanks. really, um, I picked it up and I'm telling you, I probably, I'm a pretty fast reader, but I still like, I blasted through this thing in about a day and a half. And especially like the first 40, 50 pages, every page I was like, yes, that's the thing. That's the idea. <laughs> I took a lot of notes and I want to talk about a bunch of stuff without giving away too much, but thank you for joining me, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. And it's good to talk to an actual gearhead because like just earlier today, I was talking to some journalist from the BBC and he's like, well, Matthew Crawford, clearly you like to drive, but the rest of us would rather not sit in traffic. So what do you say to that, Matthew Uh, Crawford? So frustrating. It's so frustrating. It's, uh, (laughs) you see, when I first picked up your book, Why We Drive, I was kind of expecting it to be sort of, you know, flowery prose of the open road and whatnot. And there's a little bit of that uh, for sure. But there's also, I think, uh, a very important and nuanced discussion uh, that's much bigger about smart devices and automation and our our online lives becoming integrating with real world hardware. And like, oh my God, I have a, so, a list of so many things I want to dive in. But like, let's just dive in with a a pet peeve of mine that you bring up in the book, which is the assumed inevitability of progress. We all assume the future will be this, but, but why is that a problem? Well, you know, you had, there's a whole industry of futurologists who who, tell us that the future has decided that, for example, we're all going to be rolling around in, in driverless cars. And I think it's a way of kind of, demoralizing any kind of opposition. Well, it's inevitable. Um, well, there's nothing you can do. Uh, but of course, none of this is inevitable. And no. everything so. is the result of a choice, right? Yeah. And the choice that's followed up with an action, uh, and many actions and lots of money, usually, right? <laughs> that's right. And we're talking about a massive transfer of wealth if we go down this road of driverless cars. Right. So I think the philosophy of driverless cars is much, much more interesting than the technology of can you program a GPS route into a car and make it drive a route, uh, you know, at the ability of an eight-year-old. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? But but it's it's really about what are we willing to, to, to give up in exchange for a very, very little bit of convenience. Yeah, I see uh, this as one instance of this wider push. Um, you know, automation is usually the form it takes. And it's a, it's a, it's a trend in which the demands of skill and competence give way to a promise of safety and convenience. That's usually mm-hmm. how it's presented. And um, the thing is, if you go far enough down that road of de-skilling, uh, the thing is that like our skills atrophy from lack of use, right? Just yeah. like a muscle, which leads to demands for further automation. And even Um, like you bring up in the book, uh, mental skills, such as how that like our bodies process like memories by making maps of places and associating with location. And if you live in a GPS and you're only ever going places on a GPS and following a line and and you really give yourself over to uh, predictive traffic and stuff like that, you will literally forget like you'll have less memories, right? Yeah, I mean, it's this fascinating connection between um, the parts of the brain that where you form a map of the world and and also where our memories get formed. So memories, is called episodic memory. So you, you string together these events in your life and that's sort of the story you tell about yourself. And events always happen in some place, which is why our memories are always so connected to particular mm-hmm. places. And yeah, if you basically offload the task of finding your way through the world to GPS, you're not forming those connections. And on the flip side, you know, the, the London taxi drivers who have to memorize the entire city, like their hippocampus is actually bigger in brain (laughs) scans. That's an amazing, uh, that whenever, uh, when the, the London taxi driver versus Uber battle, you know, was going on, 
I was I was so like I I, I use Uber like I'm not like morally pure you know what I mean like yeah. it, it's really convenient like I, you know what I mean what am I gonna do right? right but in London man I was so pro London cab driver because I've been to London and those guys rule they are like they're, they're true professionals yeah that's like that, that they study like doctors study <laughs> it's like it's crazy. Right. Yeah, it's been called the most demanding cognitive test of any kind. It's the comparable knowledge. to passing the bar. Yeah, yeah. the knowledge. You, you become a GPS, and not just for streets and numbers and stuff like that, but for, like, weird landmarks and, uh, you know, individual names of restaurants and businesses. It's just it's craziness what, they, what these guys have to do. And then to that, that we as a society are so willing to – give that up to this sort of algorithm that comes from this sort of black box. It's, it's a little sad. Yeah. And, and in fact, the, that's kind of the core theme of the book is just, I'm impressed with human beings and what they're capable of. And there's a certain perversity in this determination to eliminate the human element from every human activity. Right. It starts to look you, a little bit gratuitous. Yeah. If you drape it in a cloak of the term safety, right? It's like, it's like, oh, saying, oh, hey, this is my, one of my cats, Nikki, by the way. <laughs> yeah. You're, there's going to be cats just cruising through. It happens. Right. I've got four. Um, but if you drape everything in this sort of cloak of safety, well, who doesn't want a more, you know, who wants a more dangerous world? Who's going to, who's going to get up on that pulpit and go, I think we should keep the dangerous way. You know, it's, it's hard to argue against safety, but you know, sometimes the cost is really a lot worse than, than the, the, the and there's other ways, right? Like, yeah, and the cost is harder to articulate and harder to see it. You know, it's this, a subtle sort of degradation of, of human experience when you just become a passive and dependent, basically a passenger in the world. And, and there's nobody articulating that cost because it isn't, it doesn't gear automatically into debates about public policy. And unlike you say safety, that's like, once you start talking about safety, you put on a bulletproof halo right. of, you know, but, but, but there is sort of like a point beyond which you're not, like, man like you 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 know you articulated it over many dozens of pages i don't want to try and boil it down into one to one sentence but it's sort of like this like like if if that car in order to take you where you need to go it needs to know like way more about you than you would really probably be comfortable with any one company knowing about you you'd be uncomfortable with the government knowing that and the government has oversight like what does like google have or whoever like it's just like this data vacuum and we have so quickly been like yeah no that's cool like no have you seen the thing where the doors dance where you press the buttons like that's cool like you know and like and it's it and it does it does little funny quirky things that really mask the sort of cynical surveillance kind of nature of yeah. all of it. Yeah, because, I mean, th your location data, your movements through the world is some of the most valuable information about you, most valuable sort of behavioral data. So I think you have to understand, you know, why is Google getting into driverless car? What is Google? Well, it's the world's largest advertising firm. And if you don't keep that in mind, you can't really see clearly why they're getting into mobility. Yeah. I, I, I see that in practice, you know, I use a smartphone like everybody else does. And, and when I, um, you know, and I drive, uh, I drive press cars, right? So every week I'm driving a new car, which is pretty awesome. And, um, I, I, I use CarPlay a lot. I have an, I have an iPhone eight and I use CarPlay with it. I plug it in and boom, it's on the screen, right? And I would say with 40 to 50% accuracy, that predictive destination, here's where I think you're going and here's how long I think it'll take to get there. Mm -hmm. I think that it's right a lot. <laughs> like it's right a lot. And you go, wow, 
it's a little scary how right that little that thing. You know what I mean? It, it, it may know you better than you know yourself. Yeah, yeah, and you and know? it's one thing like to like go, your therapist. You know, yeah, like back and forth between your office and your house. Like I kind of get that one. That's an obvious one, but like it 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 knew I was going to the canyons like to go film a car it was like yeah. here's how long it is to angeles crest highway i was like oh shit you knew that one too didn't you i really was going there but it knew it from the 20 feet from my when i left my house i was like oh so how did you end up in this position that you're in of uh skepticism of this technology well i mean th i think this kind of skepticism is now pretty widespread people are starting to wake up to the the business logic of the internet and how dude i hear about about cars and stuff though i hear the arguments that you're making from very few people and i'm really? one of the people who makes a lot of them maybe not quite as articulately as you have here um but but yeah other uh, this this sort of like hang on you know everyone just sort of assume first off the cynical use of terms like autopilot and the media using terms like autonomous cars which are absolute horseshit is not helping it's making things like way worse and it's sort of this middle ground we're in where everybody's a beta tester and we're right. just like okay with that yeah <laughs> yeah this, i mean the the hype has far outstripped the the engineering reality and so you have cases like uber there have been now a few cases where Uber self-driving cars have hit pedestrians and it emerged in one of these investigations, you know, by the transportation safety board that um, the car had not been programmed to recognize a pedestrian crossing outside of a crosswalk. Yeah. And so, so you think, well, that's idiotic. What's, why would they put such a car out on the street and I think the only reason is they want to be first to market. Whoever's first to market is going to take the entire prize. That seems to be the logic of driverless cars. Well, so it's the, it's the law. It was the logic with uh, Uber, the 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 ride sharing model. Right. It was the logic with the, uh, the 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 house sharing model, Airbnb. Uh, yeah. You know, it it, it, it seems it's to be the still. Sorry. No, go ahead. It's called what? Oh, they call it plat platform capitalism. In other words, if you own the platform, like everyone wants to be on the same platform for obvious reasons. It's mm -hmm. like you get this network effect and it's, yeah. But when you, you know, like I, you're a motorcycle rider, I'm a motorcycle rider myself uh, in California uh, where it's civilized to ride a motorcycle. You can lane split here. Uh, yeah. The idea that you can't lane split is in other places is so unbelievably ridiculous. Isn't it? I mean, how do you, like, it's just this, it's funny because obviously it's a little risky to split lanes, especially places outside of California where they're not, where they're not looking for you. But the moralistic rage that you yeah. can provoke, you know, like people opening their doors in front of you, it's something. It's the same, I, believe, I think it's the same, it's the same kind of person who decides that whatever speed they're going is the yes. maximum spa safe speed that anybody could ever possibly be going on yeah. this highway. I'm in the left lane. I'm going 71, but oh my God, you want to go 74? Like you speed demon, you know, it's the, it's yeah. the, it's everyone's an, an officer, you know, and, and making a roadblock. It's that same mentality. Yeah. There's something about being in your car that I think encourages that. I think we're all susceptible to that kind of solipsism where you feel like the world revolves around you everyone else is in your way you're kind of sealed off from others in your private property yeah and yet we have to share the road together so it's, it has this interesting hybrid quality where it's both this hyper individualism mm -hmm. and we have to cooperate and, and that's one of the most your senses are heightened you're 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 moving and you're aware that you're moving and you're aware that car crashes are bad also well, you know and well, I think in some cars, you're far more aware of that than in others, right? The oh, more massive sure. and elevated- You were driving a Morgan three-wheeler? <laughs> yeah. 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 So one of my favorite books is up on my shop bookshelf is um, from the 60s. John Muir wrote, wrote this book called How to Keep Your Volkswagen oh, Alive. Yeah. And he has this great line in there. He says, if we all drove as if we were strapped to the car like an Aztec sacrifice, 
there to be a lot less accidents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, as, the, as the owner of a Mitsubishi Delica cab over Japanese van, I relate oh, to that 100%. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I agree. I drive that car real cool. <laughs> um, but in LA, you know, and, and not to make this about LA, but LA is a great case study for traffic uh, for uh, a place where uh, the, a lot of the culture would happily give up driving. And then uh, the rare, you know, the 10% like me who spend their weekends in the canyons and at the racetracks are, you know, from our cold dead hands people, but everybody else would go, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to take yeah. a drive myself to Hollywood on a Friday night. And I can relate to that. If you're just, I mean, sitting in stop and go traffic, yeah. there's, there's no fun in that. Yeah. Um, oh, where was I going with that? But, oh, it's a good case study in, in how um, we would, so many people are, would happily give it up, and yet there's a, so much opportunity for surveillance capitalism combined with the confusion of what actually does improve traffic flow versus what just makes us worse drivers. Add mm -hmm. on the fact that now we've got our phones and yeah. people have gotten so used to being in traffic that they sort of just resign themselves to the traffic. And they think that traffic happens to them. They're not active participants <laughs> in traffic yeah. that can yeah. actively improve it. You know, they leave huge gaps and, and, and they, they're on their brakes a lot because they're not really paying attention. And you see this on your motorcycle. <laughs> this oh, yeah. is when you see this kind of stuff. Yeah, it's interesting. The, apparently, most traffic jams don't result from an accident. It's from small lapses of anticipation, you know, where someone is not looking two, three cars ahead mm. and adjusting accordingly. Yeah. So they slam on the brakes and it just propagates backwards. Yeah, it's, uh, the, 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 the untrained, uncaring driver drives at the person's bumper in front of them. You know right. what I mean? Or just, just does anything they can to get around that because we can't be behind anybody, um, you know, <laughs> and, and if you gotta, you gotta look through cars, but um, the other um, things that I, you know, that I think are also interesting is sort of this, this, this using safety as a crutch to justify the inevitability of autonomous cars while it really ignoring successfully implementable strategies that have worked for tens and 20, 30, 40, 50 years, in, as long as there's been cars in other countries. And in fact, sometimes you see studies, and I just saw it the other day in practice. It was, I was so happy I saw it after I read your book, where I got to a, uh, driving down Venice Boulevard, three traffic lights in a row, completely out. And uh -huh. yet, there were civil, we, we treated them as stop signs and we civilly passed through with no cops present and no directions See, what to do. That's, that, that's, that's the moment that like, I, I, wanna, I, wanna, I want us to learn from it because of yeah. what it means is that we can solve problems together without the supervision of some bureaucracy or a technology that does everything for us. And I take that, that intersection that's uncontrolled you know, with by lights and whatnot, as kind of emblematic of a certain kind of democratic virtue. Yeah, it's a, it's the ability to work work things out. It, it's a little bit improvisational. We do it on the fly, and it works just fine for the most part. I read a I read a book uh, just, and the book was called Traffic, uh, and mm -hmm. it's a few years old from the early two thousands. And, and Tom Vanderbilt. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's the kind of book you would have read, and uh, and they reference a town somewhere in Scandinavia, and where their experiment was to remove all signage. The and Netherlands, yeah. The Netherlands, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it was fine. They had no, you know, it was a smaller town, but they had no problems at all. And it got It wasn't safer. just fine. It was a big decrease in um, accidents. The problem in that town had been cars hitting pedestrians. Mm. And as an experiment, as you said, they took out all signs, all, um, all curbs, all lines on the pavement, all lights. And what happens is people roll into this town and they realize it's all on them, so they pay attention. It's it's remarkable how much uh, people are are actually kind of okay with having you know to be aware of what's around them, and it, and and when you make them, <laughs> um, and and it doesn't really become much of a problem. You have to when you have to drive, but I don't know. I think it's something about just addiction to our devices combined with 
the so many people being on the road and the traffic getting really bad in the last 15 years that yeah. we're we're just like well if we're gonna be in traffic you know we might as well yeah. have a have an, a, an auto switch right yeah and again it's a totally i i'm sympathetic to that if i had a, the kind of commute that was like that I, i'd probably want one of these things um, but i don't think you know i don't think that having I don't think it's going to solve traffic as much as people think it will. Well, the interesting thing is it, it for it to realize the gains in traffic efficiency that are being promised, you kind of have to have everybody in them because That's the cars the have to be able to coordinate with one another. Yeah. And have rogue jackasses like you and me messing it up in our. Right. You know. Car to human comms is going to be a real problem. Yeah. Now in, in places like Germany, uh, with variable speed limits, you know, uh, a few years ago, they mandated uh, a certain level of receivable comms in the cars. Yeah. And so there actually really aren't speed limit signs anymore. Now, the speed limit just comes up on your dashboard, mm -hmm. and it's changing all the time. And it's changing on the conditions and it's broadcast from the, you know, National Speed Limit Center or whatever. Um, but it's, it's 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 remarkably civilized yes but it really does require basically like 100 percent adoption rates like if you have an old car like what you know you're, you're you're kind of out of luck there's no more speed limit signs but yeah. the, that transition with to to a driverless car is is gonna be nasty that's a messy transition really how, how, how do you see that i mean say a little more with cars with a with a with driven cars and and and, and computer cars having to speak to each other oh, like yeah. our 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 facial expressions our nonverbal yeah. communications like how do we talk to a car you know how does a car talk back to us other than like having like an led yeah <laughs> it's like i'm turning so one of the sort of news items when I first started writing this car that made an impression on me was a, a Google self-driving car came up on an intersection. It was a four-way stop and it came to a complete stop and waited for the other cars to do the same before going through. But of course, that's not what people do. Uh, so the car got confused and just paralyzed and it couldn't deal with it. And it's interesting that Google guy in charge said that what he had learned from the episode is that human beings need to be less idiotic by which he meant they need to behave more like robots yeah. right? strict rule followers and completely invisible to him was the kind of social intelligence you were just talking about where you make eye contact is almost a body language right. of driving yeah. but if you think the mind is basically an inferior version of a computer then this is the conclusion you draw that well that's what a software engineer would say right and that's also where you really don't want a population of people is have you ever seen a movie that's good where the whole population is more like robots like fuck no that sounds terrible you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah and and there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of dystopian movies where self-driving cars play pretty prominent roles bro i've said this before we are through the back to the future alternate timeline and we are now in the v for vendetta timeline and we are one work earthquake away from the demolition man timeline we're we're it's there dude look at the signs are on the fucking wall man we're, yeah. we're there yeah, I, yeah, I, I'm with you on that. Uh, it's it, it's funny until it's really, really, really not funny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh man! Um, but you're, you know, let's 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 talk about your your backstory a little bit because I think you've you're coming from the right place to write this book for sure. I haven't read your previous book, uh, Shop Craft Class as Soulcraft, but by the by after reading uh, Why We Drive, I, I'm definitely going to pick it up and check it out. Um, what's your car background? You're sitting in front of a chassis. Yeah, yeah, that's a, I don't know if I can, that is a, uh, a VW hot rod I'm building. So air cooled, old, old bug. Um, cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a 10 year project. And it's going <laughs> to make about five or six times the horsepower it started with. Oh, it sounds appropriate. Yeah. That's, it, it's, yeah. It's, I'm Which sure still... that won't, won't be sketchy in any way. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, as you know, it means rethinking the entire, like top to bottom, just engineered everything. Yeah, but you know what? I mean, I think I think I see Coney yellows, and I think yeah, I see yeah. disc brakes. 
And so your yeah, your those head are is Willwood right four pots up front. Yeah, is, and, is that I mean, a hydraulic just, handbrake? <laughs> It is. It's a hydro brake. Yeah, I'm gonna be drifting this motherfucker. Oh, that's you know, awesome. Yeah, because okay. sideways is is how I roll. we we could definitely be friends. What is your what? Give me the quick rundown of your of your vehicular history. Well, I started working at a Porsche shop when I was 15. It was before I even had a driver's license. Cool. Where at? Uh, this is in Emeryville, California, so the Bay Area. And uh, obviously, I was, was never going to be able to afford a Porsche, but I got a VW Bug, 63 Bug, as my first car. <clears throat> and uh, of course, you know, as soon as I got it, I started messing with it and turned it into a Baja Bug. And I had this mentor who was a VW mechanic. Uh, he built like race motors and pitted for off-road racing. And, and he, was a, he was this guy who had been like a long haired vegetarian Buddhist classical guitar playing kind of guy. But at some point he went to the dark side. And when I met him, I was about 17. He was like a gun freak. Totally oh, like, like Hunter in, Thompson dark side. Kind, well, he wasn't all performative like that. He was a quiet guy, totally alienated. But the one thing that he truly cared about was engines and he kind of imparted that spirit of craftsmanship to me when it, with regard to cars. Mm -hmm. Would you say you're more of a, a driver or more of a wrench? I'm more of a wrench. I mean, I don't have the, sk the, the skills uh, of driving. I mean, I, I love to drive, especially sideways. It's been years since I've had something fun to drive. So in my mind, I'm amazing. And in this car, I'm gonna do a lot of damage. Um, I had a friend who uh, <laughs> I had a friend named Tom, who our fans of this show will will know very well, who ha had a car when he was younger, so a sporty Subaru, crashed it, and and didn't have another car after that. But he would drive the press cars that I would get once in a while. But he'd only drive like once every three months. And when he got in the car, you know, he'd do a lot of racing simulation, simulated whatever. Oh. When he got in the car, man, he thought he was Senna. <laughs> Every time he got in these press cars, he would just be like, I saw Colin McRae do this on this video. It's like, yeah. you are, we're going to the grocery store. He turns off traction control. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. uh, I noticed in the book you, uh, you went out with uh, some of the drifters, who are some of my favorite people. Yeah. Is that what inspired you to put the hydro brake on your car? Well, I've all, you know, I watched those Ken Block videos. I mean, Talk about art. That guy is an artist, right? Yeah. I mean, just the way he can put his car within an inch of where he wants it with four wheels smoking. Um, so yeah, I, I got to ride in a Formula D drift car around uh, Virginia International Raceway. That's um, the best, isn't it? There's nothing it was, like that. It's wild. It was, it, it, so this is tandem drifting, you yeah. know? So they're like a few feet apart. And the cabin completely fills with tire smoke yeah and then you're just in this white cloud and they're still just on it you know they're yeah, just like smacking the those... rev limiter and it's like they're not they're not they can't see but they don't care it's it's one thing to be able to get a car sideways hold it straighten it out you know do a nice slide you know then do it again do it a couple times repeat it and go the other way it's one thing to learn how to control a car in terms of being able to drift a corner i can do that and it took a long time to learn but then, <laughs> then to do it without being able to see or breathe. <laughs> With other cars a few feet away from Yeah, you. yeah. I mean, even I've been in those cars like that. And, you know, you've seen, I've seen videos too. I'm sure you have as well of, you know, Formula One car in the wet you know, and not the guy in first place, the guy in fifth place, you know, <laughs> the wet where it's just like, eh, eh okay. And yeah. this is the same thing where you have to just know where you are because you legitimately cannot see it's right. crazy yeah there was that uh, i was just they watched one of those formula one documentaries just the other night um who was it the uh was it the nuts. ferrari one that's now on uh there's a ferrari one i think it's on netflix now there's a bunch of them yeah racing to immortality that's just about all the drivers that died racing for enzo ferrari yeah. <laughs> it's really depressing it's crazy and enzo himself was like he didn't give a fuck yeah like, he was a yeah dick. you should go out there and you might die and yeah 
he expected you to die for him like a gladiator. And then yeah. he also treated his paying customers like shit too. He treated, <laughs> he basically treated everybody like shit and he was rewarded throughout life for that behavior. Yeah, well. The My favorite one is about safety. Actually. It's called just the number one. That was the one I was thinking of. That, yeah. that film fucking rocks. I, I've yeah. probably watched that movie 40 or 45 times. It's awesome. Yeah, there's a there's a quote at the beginning of that or near the beginning where I forget the guy's name. He was sort of a, a minor Formula One guy, but they showed this horrendous wreck that he walked away from. In fact, ran away from to get in a new car. Oh, Martin Brundle. Martin Brundle. And 96 he, Australian GP. That yeah. was it. Yeah, he so flew he, through the air. <laughs> and what he said that struck me, he said, at some point, it's incredible, it became unacceptable to die in the name of sport. Mm -hmm. um, and then right after that, there was a quote from, I think, um, Graham Hill's son. Yeah. So they're Damon. showing, yeah, they're showing um, World War II, like fighter spitfires and stuff. And what he said also stuck in my mind was, you know, after World War II, it became perfectly natural to seek glory in a vehicle. Yes. Making that parallel from the dogfight. Yeah, racing. Well, that's when auto racing, I mean, we definitely had auto racing, you know, pre-World pre War II, um, but it was really an elite sport. Right. After the war, um, it there became a much more of a demand for somewhat more affordable racing. Uh, and it really, really, really took off. And the, and the, but the tracks did not like in the, in the middle sixties, the cars just got insanely fast and they're basically racing on, you know, roads in the woods. <laughs> and it's so yeah. shady. Yeah. But that's also, it, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say part of another thing that came out of that film um, is they talk about, at a certain point, the racing got very dangerous and the organizers would say, well, if you think it's dangerous, just slow down. And they would right. put it on the drivers, which is right. so unfair. It, it's and it, that, There's parallels in that to other things that we are seeing, uh, like in your book and, and, in, and in other things in society where it's like, no, if you allow people to just you need to have a, a, a come from an organization of, of safety and, and, and create the, those standards. You're reminding me driving suggestions, which I love. What say again? Like your graduated licensing suggestions, oh, yeah, yeah. which I love. We can get to that. But what you just said reminded me of in ice hockey, I think it was maybe in the sixties or seventies. Um, no one would wear a helmet, right? No one wanted to be the, the pussy wearing the helmet. Right. Um, and so the only way they were going to start wearing helmets is if they made it mandatory. So you have to do that because of the social pressure. Right. And it's Jackie just like, Stewart would be like lobbying drivers, like, please put your seatbelts on. And they'd be like, fuck you, mate. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they would do, yeah. And it's like, no, you got it. But you, you know, you, then you have uh, Sid Watkins and guys like that coming in. And, and from the organizational level, yeah, and if right. they mandate that the car yeah. is safe, if so you that's allow a driver to choose a fast yeah. car or a safe car, they're going to choose the fast car. So you yeah. mandate that the car is safe. That's the point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, graduated driving standards, something I've been a huge proponent of that I love that you brought up in your book. Well, I so I so other people are saying this. I I just I just feel like I pulled out of my out of my no, ass, just like but, me and my friends. We are we're okay. not like publishing papers on it. <laughs> yeah. So but my no, idea. Please, give me your theory. Well, um, you know, it's perfectly understandable. Some people want to get around with a minimum of involvement in a car that an SUV that weighs six thousand pounds, and uh, they couldn't be bothered with driving. Fine. Okay. So. If it's not driverless, here's your driver's license, and you here's your speed limit, and and then at the opposite end of the extreme would be someone in a Lotus, you know, that weighs like two thousand pounds, and uh, he, he's able to put it into a four wheel drift at will and slot it into a tight parking spot, you know, quickly, and so he would have a little more discretion in deciding what seems best in getting from point A to point B. 
And you could even make these different driver's licenses visible on different colored license plates. So you that was it. where I really like it. That was where I, you took it to another level because now it's status that you right. can't buy, that you have to earn the status with skill. Yeah. Well, you could buy right. it in terms of a car, uh, the correct vehicle, but combined with, with a skill level. Right. That's why people play. That's why people participate in ways. It's because of the points. It's ah. because they make it into a bullshit game and you can have points. And if, if you get points on, did you know that if you get points on ways for like reporting cops and stuff like that, that you get status on ways? Did you know that? I never even used ways. I, and I don't know why, just lazy, but it, it, in Los but, Angeles ways is very helpful because you've got an enormous grid and there are virtually yeah. infinite ways to get from point A to point B. So even if yeah. you know how to get there, mm -hmm. where it is, you know, ways will, tell you the fastest way and if you're on the highway it crowdsources where police are it is right. remarkably no, it sounds great for that purpose yeah yeah but you know you can get lazy and you can definitely get it but if you re report stuff as an active user they mm -hmm. give you status sure yeah. and your your reports get prioritized and all kind of stuff they make anytime you can enlist vanity in the service of the the common good that's great yes yeah. yeah, like when Jay Leto would talk about the Prius, they like, he made it ugly. So you could say, <laughs> look at this ugly thing I'm driving for yeah. the planet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and that was what, you know, that's what uh, Elon Musk and those guys figured out with the Model S is that they could, they could make a stylish thing where people could, you know, yeah. thumb their nose at everybody else and go, oh, you're not, you're not saving the planet with your with your, it, your your gas car yeah car. sort of virtue signaling yeah. on the road and yeah. then since i moved back to the bay area i saw started seeing these stickers on that on the bumpers of cars it was, took a while before i could actually look at one up close so it means that you have a virtuous car and therefore you're allowed to use the carpool lane even if you don't have other people in your car you know what i had a chevy volt actually and i got a carpool sticker on it and I thought that was the shit. I was like, you think you're dope in your Bentley? Well, I can go in this lane and you fucking can't. So, yeah. uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But I, I feel that way now on a motorcycle and I have a lot more fun. Because <laughs> you can motorcycle in the carpool lane as well, which is, uh, mm -hmm. is safer. Um, but dude, no, the, it's, the key to the graduated licensing plan is that different colored plate. Because now mm -hmm. you've got a priority status symbol that you can openly display. Yeah. That's right. That's like very platinum. good. Yeah. Except, you know, there's going to be like a black market for them shits. You know, there's like, it's going to be some, you know, right. you got to know you'd someone, the, that guy who, or girl, whoever's in charge of that system would end up taking like the biggest bribes in the history of the state of California. or something. Yo. Like that. You know what I mean? Why is it that car people are so cynical like us? It's, it's something to do with uh, dealing with bureaucracy as much as we have to, when you've got like six registered vehicles yeah. and you're, Spend half your life in the DMV. At the DMV. What's your? What is your? I, I I liked your DMV chapter. What is your? What is your nightmare DMV story? Oh God! I mean, it's it's remarkably consistent. You go there first. You stand in the standing line to get your little piece of paper that gives you a number. This is at least in Virginia, where I've been living the last twenty years. So it'll say E thirty seven, and you look up on the monitor and it says now serving. A13, L19, Z, you know, 20, and you, you have no idea. It's this inscrutable cube. The letter thing is really, is really a mind fuck, isn't it? It's like it's designed to it just is. make you resigned to your fate. Uh, you just get go, you know, I can't even do the math. I don't even know. <laughs> they might call Z next. I don't fucking know. I, I know yep. exactly how you feel. <laughs> that letter thing is the scam. It's like, um, like I make YouTube videos, right? And they don't tell you what the multiplier is. You know what I mean? If I turn ads on and I get 100,000 views, it's 100,000 times some multiplier that they don't tell you and they just change. It's like there's no way to audit it. And that's, this is the same thing as putting the letter at the beginning of that fucking DMV number. You have no idea. It probably categorizes something. It probably is like he's doing a plate return and she's doing a re-reg and they're taking a test. It probably means something, right? Well, right. It's probably it's, it's designed to serve the convenience of the people who work there. And that's understandable. But 
you know, on the other hand, is supposed to be serving the public. Yeah. And it'd be nice to know where you stand. There's quite a few things that are supposed to be serving the public and haven't quite been doing that recently. We Isn't it interesting how <laughs> once you start talking about cars and traffic, it's like a window into everything fucked up in society and right. also everything that's, that's fun, about moving at speed. We have a theory uh, that, that uh, <laughs> there's a direct correlation between uh, how, how much people obey, uh, how, how normal people drive and the, the authoritarian <laughs> nature of their governments. It's, there's a, you could draw like a pretty oh. straight line, actually. You, you got you to gotta work that up into an article. <laughs> I you know don't want to be what, on a list. <laughs> you know what it amazes me? So in Virginia, you know, like everywhere else, except California, no lane splitting. So you'll be, it'll be 95 degrees. And there's the Harley guy sitting there, sweltering in a traffic jam. Uh, well, a yard and a half of empty yeah. space next to him. And so across the, the wings of the eagle on his vest, it says freedom, right? Well, meanwhile, he's sweating his balls off. Then you go to <laughs> someplace like- cooled bike. <laughs> yeah, like Mumbai, and there's a family of four on a yeah. little 50cc bike, like weaving through. Yeah. And they're just getting it done. Third world motorcycling is the jam. And I don't mean yeah. to use third world in a negative way at all. I mean, like the Far East and stuff, like yeah. getting on two wheels is awesome over there. Yeah. It's, it's, it, and it, their systems work. Like, I think. It's so efficient, it's, right? Uh, but we say that, but like, do we know that those systems aren't incredibly dangerous? Do a lot of people <laughs> die over there? And we're just like, yeah, it should be like that. And, but like, everybody dies and we just don't hear about it. Well, you can look up, you can look up the traffic fatality uh, statistics for different countries that this, the WHO uh, mm -hmm. maintains that you can find it on Wikipedia. It's interesting. Um, Rome is one of those places where Americans go to and they come back horrified because like, <laughs> yeah. it looks like total chaos. Yeah. Well, it's very old. You know, it's not it's not as organized as a modern city. The streets are narrow and, and Italians look, are kind of aggressive. You know, you got to yeah. be a little aggressive with a car there. Yeah. And it doesn't look like they're following any rules, but True. their traffic fatality rate is lower than ours. So is that because they're drunk and they go loose when they hit stuff because <laughs> the wine. I don't know. There's some I'm just kidding. uncanny Italian hive mind. Are they all able to predict one another's behavior, right? Because mm -hmm. they're on the same page somehow. Yeah. What about, but if you, if you apply that to, to the Far East, I wonder if that, I, I don't know. I have, I have done no research, but I wonder if it's like, you know, the, the school of fish, like in Vietnam, right? The school of fish motorcycles where it's just this beautiful kind of moving mass and people move in and out of it, you know, and someone can just walk across the street and it'll just like, you know, part like the Red Sea to go around them. And, but, but, but. Do a lot of Might, people die doing yeah, that? Yeah, <laughs> a lot of people do die because also they're not wearing helmets for the That's most part. That's true. Yeah, yeah, so safety standards. I think standards, yeah. what you're seeing there is they're, they're trading off some safety for a massive gain in, in traffic efficiency in terms of the use of the road surface. They just well, that's how full. I feel about riding a motorcycle in Los Angeles. I mean, I understand that it is a little bit dangerous and I wear yeah. a helmet and I wear gloves and a jacket and boots, you know, but uh, – but, but, oh my God, the ability to say, I will be there in 20 minutes and fucking mean it. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? The ability right. to like, you know, I've had days where like my wife and I will leave the house. We live in Venice and we'll leave the house at the same time and I'll be on a bike or my Vespa and she'll be in a car. And after like, you know, 30 minutes, I'll, I'll text her and like, she'll be like four miles away and I will be on the absolute other side of the city. I mean, it's just impossible. And you know, the efficiency of it, the cheapness yeah. of it, the cons low consumables, the fact that like a $2,000 scooter will last as long as a hundred thousand dollar Mercedes <laughs> and get 50 miles to the gallon, right? Yeah. More. My Vespa will, will do 60. It's great. Mm. It's fucking great. I love being on two wheels. Like you said, you just, your, your road usage is zero. Yeah. You're invisible. Yeah. There's some weird mentality that's pretty prominent in the West. I think that I call it the ideology of safety ism where the safer we become, the more intolerable any remaining risk appears. Mm -hmm. And it's like, there's no end to this. 
Yeah, I mean, is that like like you said? I mean, this it, draping anything in the cloak of safety could easily result in removing humans from the equation entirely. Yeah. Um, and the the technology of that, even if the morality is sorted out, will take a long time. But they, the our governments and our and these private companies have already shown that they are more than willing to beta test all the way there. And yeah. like I said, that's going to be a messy ass process because there's just like. Why do people think that a computer is anywhere near as capable of driving as a human? Why do people think that? It's so obviously untrue. Yeah, well, there's been a lot of sort of concerted effort to persuade you of that. So Tesla is an interesting case because here you have partially automated driving, right? The lane keeping, the automatic braking, and, and now the, the autopilot is the name of the package that includes all these things, including auto steer. Mm. And when all that went live, um, the government came out with this claim of a 40% reduction in crashes with auto steer activated. It was like, wow, that's amazing. And there's this one guy who calls himself a forensic statistician, got very curious about this because it didn't seem to match what he could find from like insurance records with Tesla's. Uh, he took him two years of suing the government to get the data. They wouldn't give it up. Turns out the government just got the data from Tesla. Once he cleaned up the data, he found actually a slight increase in accidents with auto steer engaged for reasons that are, that are interesting we could get into. But Yeah, the long, the long and short of it in the book was that it was a selective use of data. They pulled, they pulled the crashes yeah. from this one and the auto steer yeah. from this one. And yeah. yeah, it was not, it was a cynical and, use of the data. And I think it, that's just one of those episodes that confirms the sense a lot of people have that these different elites that ought to be, have a kind of antagonistic relationship, right? Regulators and industry and journalism Sometimes they all seem to be in cahoots to push this narrative of progress that may turn out to be uh, pretty sketchy. So, you know, I think it contributes to the cynicism of people about their institutions. Yeah, but it's, this, but it's so weird that the cynicism seems so much there about the government than it does about, like, private industry, I feel yeah. like, is prevailing. And, but, like, because – and I feel like it's because we're so – we've grown up on capitalism and the efficiency of business and we've worshiped that. So, and people have not really stopped to understand the fact that like governments are not supposed to run like a business. Like they're strictly services. Like they don't need to, to be like, like, I don't need, I don't want the, the them to have like profit built into them. Like, and I certainly don't want to like just give it over to some like, company that might be more efficient but is you know turning an enormous profit margin on our data on the back end or whatever you know yeah i think we still have this habit sort of of thinking you know libertarians always think the government is the threat to liberty right but some of these uh technology firms have become like little governments or not so yeah. little right so in terms of the the far-reaching role they have in our lives and so I think we just don't have the intellectual habit of looking for threats to liberty coming from these enormous commercial entities. But yeah. that's where the main action is now. Well, it's where like, like if you go, I think the, that libertarian government threat thing, it goes back to like sort of 80s kind of Cold War, yeah. maybe even a little before that. But, right. but I think that what we're seeing in America now is almost like a post USSR Russia, where the technocrats are really getting to present this very liberal front facing thing and, 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 
I've been in the offices of social media companies, and so I know. <laughs> but <laughs> but on the other end, their policies are so buddy buddy with what the conservative right. governments want, and and the hyper capitalistic nature of all of it. The scenario mm-hmm. you present in the book about what happens when your Google shopping history gets integrated with your car's GPS, I was like, oh fuck! Will you read? Will you spell that one out for us real quick? Well, you know, you can imagine, uh, I mean, you can imagine that you didn't, don't even have to pay for rides in driverless cars. You just hail one, right? Because it's free. Well, not really free because you get in and you have to spend the first 20 minutes declining all these offers tailored to your unique lifestyle uh, because the car wants to take you on a route that will take you past these different opportunities. Um, there's all kinds of ways that you can integrate people's mobility with uh, trying to nudge and herd their behavior into profitable channels. Yeah, I don't even think you have to go so far as to to say a free ride hailing car would have that. I think if you have, you know, I think one of the things that Tesla has done uh, to attract the non-car enthusiast super well is basically sell you a car that is almost like a do- just a dock for your phone that's got wheels on it, right? So, so whatever you whatever your whatever's in your phone is just it's just dumped into the car and then it's sent right to Tesla, and yeah. and you know you, you that kind of stuff can all of a sudden become part of your normal uh, uh, route, right? Yeah. And it's just it's the creepiness is, I think, the, the bottom line here. I mean, regardless of whatever the, you know, kind of nudging of your behavior, it's, it's like remote control. Yeah. And that you, know what, say- you know what always happens in all the movies? Every one of these post-apocalyptic, you know, future movies where we have a city full of driverless cars, you know what always happens about 20 minutes from the end of them movies? A human wrestles control of that car. Yeah. Right? right? A human, like rips the joystick out and is now has got control again right yeah yeah even even in fucking demolition man they're like i need a 1970 oldsmobile fucking 442 you know what i mean like (laughs) i need a car that's so analog it doesn't even have a fucking suspension or brakes like let's go you know (laughs) that that's what always happens the end of every one of these movies is let me wrestle control back from this autonomous car yeah, I'm keeping a set of Webers and a uh, you know centrifugal advanced distributor on hand for when the when the apocalypse comes. Have you seen The Last Race? No. It's a movie from the '80s where driving early '80s, maybe '81 or '82, where driving is forbidden. Autom- uh, human driving is forbidden, and a guy has disassembled in his storage unit like a Porsche 962 Le Mans race car like a uh-huh. crazy Lamar car and he just like builds it in the garage and like mobs across the country in this Lamar car. How have I not seen this? I, be, I only heard of it recently. He's being chased by a fighter plane. It's like, it's fucking ridiculous, but it's, it's, it's kind of where we're going. You know, it, it's, I, and I think people think that we're being dramatic, but I don't think we're being dramatic at all because I really think this shit's already happening with phones and the more we integrate our phone with our car, you know, the, it's just, it's just going to happen more and more. There's no undoing this. There's no fucking way there's undoing this. Yeah, and that's the feeling of like there's this sort of grid, this tightening around you in all these kind of opaque ways that are hard to even wrap your head around and yeah. decisions happening somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And I think this contributes to this kind of populist moment that we've had the last few years. In fact, you could point to the yellow vests, which begins right. as an automotive protest. Um, it, it's sort of against this shadowy establishment uh, where decisions are just happening somewhere else. And it's a totally undemocratic process. Yeah. And look, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily uh, anti gearhead to say that somewhere like lower Manhattan should have should be heavily restricted with vehicle traffic right like I went to Amsterdam in 2018 2018 I went to Amsterdam and they they've gotten rid of a ton of car traffic from the center in Amsterdam yeah and it is spectacular yeah right quiet 
the air is clean yeah. you know there's some EV, evs running around but but trucks can only go at certain hours and stuff and there's a lot of bicycles it's really bike friendly and and it's fantastic and so the idea of going yes in our in our dense cities in boston and and philly and downtown new york like let's do this i get that and but but then you you think about the whole rest of the country and it's like that shit ain't gonna work <laughs> well i mean one thing if we had invested in public transportation and building the cities around that idea 100 years ago or mm -hmm. 200 years ago but we really didn't uh whereas in europe they did so yeah you can have a a, a city with very few cars and it, it works i uh, in now i don't want to uh, uh in europe in, in, I don't want to say this the wrong the wrong word could really get me fucked up here, uh, but in Europe, transportation wise, did the fact that they had a massive rebuilding effort in the second half of the '40s uh, into the '50s, and America really just built on our railroads, you know, and never never had that wipe it down and start over with a new a new network kind of thing. You think that had anything to do with it? Well it's interesting. The a lot of the public transportation infrastructure in European cities is from before the war. It's it's like early twentieth century. Hmm. And at the same time in the US we went all in on the automobile, even True, before afterwards. most people had them. Um, and of course, they had to rebuild all that after the war. I mean, well, that actually the London tube was one of the few places to survive the blitz. People went down there to get away from the bombs. Actually, you know what, I think, I think you know what, that, you're probably right. I think it may have, it, I believe, it may have had more to do with the, the fact that their cities are very old and the streets are very narrow. And so that may have just been what they had to do if they weren't unless they were going to widen every single street you know our our street cities were built around a standard lane width and a standard parking size parking spot mm. size and that's why i believe like smart cars didn't really take off here because be below a certain size what's the point like you know anything smaller than like a mini or a fiesta is just like why you know right. but yeah. but we're pushing it now with the trucks fuck me we got a problem right. the size of vehicles yeah, you'll see you'll see these you know guys in their F two fifty just diagonal across two or even three parking spots. Yeah, I mean you you know you just can't fit these things in a in a city. I get it in Texas and whatever you could they're bigger you can fit you yeah. there. But um, you know I, uh, I I really liked the book, Matt. I Thanks. thought it was great. I I uh, I really am looking forward to picking up Shop Classes Soulcraft, your other book. And uh, yeah. and checking that out. Give me what's uh wh that's pretty much about. Tell me what is that one about? Shop classes, look up. That's uh, a case for working with your hands. It's a case for the skilled trade. So I used to have a motorcycle repair shop. I used to work as an electrician, and of course I've had a bunch of white collar jobs too. And when that book came out ten years ago, um, it seems like there was all this push to you know knowledge work as though you know working with your hands is not knowledge work. Mm -hmm. I've actually been more intellectually challenged doing some of the trade jobs I've had than sitting in a cubicle. So it was a case for uh, how, how cognitively rich and demanding it can be to, to work in the trades and to make a case for it as a life worth choosing you know, for a young person. I'd like to read that. I think that's very interesting as well. I mean, I, I have a non-traditional job. It's certainly not a, a full-time desk job. I work outside a lot. Um, and, yeah. and, and I, and On I the Angeles Crest Highway, huh? Hell yeah, or in the desert or racetracks or whatever. But but I, I am always, uh, having grown up in New York uh, area and moved out to LA, I've met so many people that have uh, really interesting Hollywood jobs, uh, set builders and costume people. And right. it's like, holy shit, like you can do professional arts and crafts. Like, yeah. like really professional level fucking arts and crafts, wood, paint, plaster, and yeah. you can earn deep in the six figures and get an Oscar for it. Like, did you know that shit? And yeah. I go back to my old high school because I didn't really enjoy the traditional I don't not like math and, and mm -hmm. I didn't even like writing and I'm even kind of a writer now um, it turned out you can write like you talk did you know that you can uh, but I go back to my old school and I go guys if you don't like this like 
if something you do like is probably out there, if you're willing to like learn how to do it pretty well, like you could do almost anything as a job if you get pretty good at it. You know? That's such a valuable lesson because I think most kids are sitting in school bored out of their minds, yeah. especially the boys, you know, just to sit at a desk for 16 years. Yeah, I don't recommend just, it. Yeah. I don't. There's people who are like going out and do, doing farms and shit now and they're kind of, they're all about it. You know what I mean? I, 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 get, I get that 100%. Speaking of Hollywood, uh, you know Nick Offerman, the actor? I do, yes, I, I, know, I don't so know him personally. Park, parks but, and yeah. Recreation and a bunch of different uh, great stuff. He started as a set carpenter oh, in yeah. Hollywood, huh. and he still has a cabinet shop where he makes actually really beautiful furniture. Really? Oh yeah, yeah. I go check I, out I, Nick I, Offerman. <laughs> That's awesome. No. So uh, the reason I know all that is because um, Popular Mechanics hired me to write an article about him. So I went and, and hung out with him for a couple of days. Oh, I bet that's so interesting. I love I love to find out stuff like that. Yeah. The best the best uh, the best car factory. You know I love factories and 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 any t- any opportunity to go to a car factory is a good one. They're all different. You every time you go to a car factory, you immediately understand the cars that come out of that factory, mm. even if they are otherwise boring seeming cars. And the best one in the world by far is the Morgan factory in oh. the UK, where there's guys sawing wood <laughs> and fucking belt sanding yeah. and there's generations of guys working uh-huh. next to each other and it's a ch- it's just the best you've never seen anything like it you go i can't believe this is going on in 2020 these guys are making cars like this and selling them for a hundred thousand dollars because yeah. there is because authenticity is worth money real authenticity you know uh, I believe that there's, I have some optimism though. I don't know about you. I have some optimism that as the general public moves towards automated eggs, there will at least for our lifetimes, for you and I's lifetimes, be a niche for people like you and I who want to drive very engaging, lightweight and responsive cars. And I think that if the major OEMs won't serve that market, that you will see people like Lotus and Ariel serving that market. And you will see continuation series of old cars, as well as a uh, entire sub economies on keeping restoring and maintaining old cars. Yeah. Um, that's already here. I mean, you can, you can uh, roll your own, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Make it exactly how you want it. Oh, that's awesome. You don't use social media, do you? No. Good I for just, you. How did you, just, how have you made it this far? Uh, as an author and, and a, a philosopher of sorts and avoided that trap? I don't know. I just never, I could sort of see it from a distance. Like Twitter was just getting going when my first book came out. And I was like, yeah, didn't interest me. And I'm so glad I didn't because I, yeah, I see the right get, side of that one. <laughs> get, like trapped in it and you feel like you can't get out. And then the, the, the witch hunts and the mobs that come after you. Yeah. Well, if you dare to think, you yeah. know, if you if you dare to think, somebody will someone will have something to say about it. I think you chose wisely. If I was you, I wouldn't pick it up now. No. <laughs> you nope. you have you have a good long form, and and I um, you know, some books I go through quick, some books I go through slow, and some books I bail out in the middle. This one I I went through really fast. This is a great read. Why we drive towards a philosophy of the open road. Uh, by Matthew B. Crawford. And you know he take it's take him seriously to use that full name with the middle initial and shit. That's right. <laughs> well, other than the book, where can we get the book? Uh, wherever fine books are sold. Yeah, preferably your local bookseller. Call right. them and request it. That's what we want to do. Keep the lights right. on in those places. Right. Dude, thank you for uh, thank you for coming. It's re- um, it was a real pleasure, man. Yeah. So yeah, let's do it again. I hope uh, when this shit show is over, you can come see us in Los Angeles at uh, West Side Collector Car Storage. We have a new studio. Um, I, and, I think uh, we need to have maybe have a little grudge match up the Angeles Crest Highway once I get this bug rolling. Oh, bro, and, you can go your bug versus my old whatever car. Whatever you want. All right, all right. I got. I'll bring something old <laughs> and, and overpowered. Um, okay. And also, you know, you should. You, you, I need to put you together. Do you know Alex Roy? Do you know of Alex Roy? No. Alex Roy is a, is a philosopher also. He's an author. He writes for The Drive. He's written a book. And he, he works in the autonomous car research industry. Oh. Um, but he's also, he and I are working on something called the Human Driving Association. 
which is to is a is a small little outfit. Yeah, small little outfit that is not really doing much yet, but our our time will arise where we will need to legitimately lobby Congress or whoever, local or national level politicians, for the rights of human drivers, which will ultimately be, be in jeopardy, possibly in our lifetimes. Well, yeah, count me in. Cool. No, after I finished your book, I seriously texted Alex, and I was like, this is your guy. You got to get this guy on here. Mm -hmm. So uh, thanks for sharing this hour with me, Matt. I appreciate it. Yeah, again, it was a pleasure. So thank you. Awesome. That's our show. Smoke Entire Podcast, powered by Shout Engine. Get your own podcast at shoutengine.com. It's easy. All you need is a microphone, a connection to the internet, and ideally, something to say. Matthew B. Crawford, author of Why We Drive. Thank you, sir. And we'll see you guys next week.